Thank you so much for being here for another live Action for Happiness event. My name is Mark Williamson and it's fantastic to be with you all and part of this amazing Action for Happiness community of people taking you know, practical steps in our own lives to create a happier and kinder world together. Um, I'm particularly excited this evening, uh, well it's evening UK time but I know you're all around the world, to be joined by Tom Fortismeyer. So Tom, thank you so much for joining our community today. Oh, my absolute pleasure, Mark. Really looking forward to spending time with you. I'm a big admirer of your work. And I think we're going to do something rather special together with this group this evening because your wisdom is going to allow us to explore bits of what's going on inside our, um, uh, well, inside us as human beings that I don't think we've done in one of these events before. Today's event is called Feel Good Enough. And I, for one, can say that's something that I've often found hard to do in my own life. So, Tom, we're really grateful to have your expertise in having worked with, I know, many thousands of people in exploring um, these aspects of self-sabotage that we have inside ourselves and how we can both understand them and take action. So uh, in a moment, Tom and I will be uh, starting a conversation on that, and you will all have a chance to participate in that in various different ways during our hour or so together. Um, if you're new to an Action of Happiness event, thank you so much for being here and very warm welcome. If you're, if you're back again, thank you for being part of this community. Please, as always, keep it friendly and constructive and relevant in the chat. And there is a chance for you to ask Tom questions. So please do use the Q&A function and you can vote on each other's questions and we'll come to those a bit later in the session. Uh, but Tom, I'd love to start actually by just asking you to share a bit more about your background, you know, your your experience both professionally but also why this topic of self-sabotage and, and feeling good enough is is so relevant to you and and perhaps to all of us thank you mark yes yeah, so i've been a therapist for nearly 24 years now and pretty rapidly when i started my practice i became absolutely fascinated with this self-destructive tendencies that i saw both in myself and in my clients and I was just amazed to see how common it is to some degree most feeling holding on to some rem remnants of just really not feeling good enough and I saw it primarily early on as being this thing that we had to fix that there was this inherent problem that just really held people back and of course it does I mean it can cause extraordinary amounts of trouble in our lives it can block an awful lot of joy love abundance create massive amounts of stress but what I discovered and what I'm excited to share here today is that this comes from a part of our mind that is desperately trying to help us. And most people, they fight the symptom of the sabotage, the procrastination or the addictions or the ever busyness or all the different things people might do without understanding where it's coming from. And when you can understand where it's coming from, it gives you a chance to negotiate with it, to change it, and to get on your own side, get out of your own way, and finally feel good enough. What a lovely thought and a lovely framing for this conversation. Um, and before we go into the details, as I mentioned, I know, Tom, you're going to share with us some interactive practices and, and some of the ways we can look inwards that hopefully will enlighten us not only to what we can do to feel good enough but also perhaps what's going on behind some of this as you've just said and so I just wanted to say just for the, the sort of psychological safety of all of us in this community um, mm -hmm. you know we're going to encourage you to get involved but there might be things that come up that sort of raise difficult emotions for you uh, in thinking about aspects of your past or things that you might find traumatic uh, depending on your own background so just to say to anyone and everyone here uh, this is entirely optional and please choose uh, use your own judgment to you know either not partake in an activity or to to move on from this um if you think it's um, going to be not appropriate for you in the state of mind that you're in today so please do above all prioritize your own self-care uh, we are in the action for happiness month still of self-care september and that is of course the priority tom anything you wanted to add on that yeah it's just i mean some of the things may just in a really poignant kind of filled with nostalgia and pathos make you feel emotional and some things might draw to your attention something yeah that is really challenging and and so for me if those emotions are rising that there's 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 beauty there and to be to create a, a sense of welcome for all of your emotions 
And at the same time, you might not be in the state of mind where you feel like doing that. And so just notice if you feel like, you know what, this isn't for me right now. I can come back to this or there are different ways in which I can engage in this later. And so just honor what you feel you need in the moment. Don't push yourself. And at the same time, be open to your full experience. Thank you. And, and Tom, I know in a moment we're going to do a sort of initial reflection practice uh, together. I just wanted to just just understand a bit more about what you said in, in your introduction there about this idea that, first of all, this self-sabotaging behaviour of not feeling good enough is quite common. It seems to be, you know, mm-hmm. so many of us struggle with this. But also you said something important about, like, in some ways, there's part of us that's, I think you said, beautiful in a way that's like trying to protect us from from something so it, i wonder if you could say a bit more about this uh, inner protector mm. that we may have and where it may be going wrong or where it may be helpful i will just before we do that let's just um uh, make the concept of self-sabotage completely relatable because mm. you know for some people that might be an unfamiliar term or they might get a sense that they sabotage themselves uh, and everyone to do some degree does it a bit and certainly in certain areas we're prone to it um But I would say you have a problematic relationship with sabotage where it's probably causing quite a lot of trouble or if not trouble, it is affecting how successful you are and how much you're enjoying your life. Um, If you struggle to receive compliments, uh, two, if you attract either um, unavailable or dysfunctional partners, or there's a painful repeating pattern in your relationship choices, Or if when things are going well, there's this part of you that's worrying that someone's going to knock on the door and call you a fake or call you out as an imposter, or that there's just this feeling that you don't quite enjoy the good moments because you just think the rug's going to be taken out from under your feet. Um, And and finally, if you you struggle with compulsive behaviours or addictions that you're doing more than you want to, or you feel you have less control, um, and you find yourself marvelling at at these behaviours, knowing that they prevent you from moving forward in your life, then that those are pretty strong indicators, but the first is probably the most reliable indicator. If you struggle to receive compliments, and I don't mean by that, because some people they've learned to be polite because they know people don't like it if you brush off their compliments. So they might verbally say, oh, thank you. But internally they're calling it BS, wondering what agenda someone has, thinking that they must be delusional or, you know, or thinking that they're just being flattered to get something. So you will know if you struggle, you know, to receive compliments, you know, and um, and so let's talk a little bit about why, you know, so I work with a lot of people who probably if you ask them, they would describe themselves as having low self-esteem. Like, I don't feel good enough. And people feel as though it's this set piece. It's this set feeling. It's like, oh, I haven't had the experiences or the support to feel great about myself and so I don't I just don't feel that good about myself I don't feel good enough but the truth is most commonly actually we have a part inside us that doesn't want us to feel good enough it is opposed to us and this is the piece the saboteur the internal saboteur, it's a part of our psychology and it is doing that and it is causing, for some people, extraordinary amounts of trouble, extraordinary amounts of trouble and costing a fortune in some areas. And compared to the joy and the abundance we could be experiencing, proportionally, it's devastating. And what a lot of people do, if they spot that or they feel that, they go to war with themselves. They try and use willpower or magical mornings or affirmations or visualizing, or they're putting all this effort into being a better person. But then they're trying to battle with this internal feeling of not being good enough. Thinking it's some fixed point they have to work on without realizing it's actually being created upheld and perpetuated by a part of us on purpose and that on one level is terrifying but on another level is amazing because we can we can we can find that part and we can negotiate with it and we can thank it and we can understand when we take it to it and we demonstrate to that part that we understand why it's doing what it's doing which we'll share in this conversation then it's like, oh, finally, 
you understand why I've been causing all this trouble for you. Now we can work together. Now we can work together. And so it's game changing. It's absolutely game changing, completely transformed my life. And I work with people who've been in therapy for years. And that this piece is just not fully, fully known in a lot of traditional talking therapies. It's not fully represented. It's not fully served. And uh, it just, it makes such a huge, a huge difference. Mm. Thank you for that context. And I know that your work has been literally life-changing with many people. And of course, in this sort of session with such a large audience and only a limited amount of time, this is really a, a chance to get a flavor of this. But I actually think the core concept you're introducing is something that can be one of those light bulb switch moments of like oh as you say so um would you like to bring us into a bit more of a meditative presence so we can start to experience a little bit of this way of thinking tom i know you um yeah uh, yeah. Well, I think this, yeah so we're going to start with just one process and it's an invitation it's like i'm going to get you to close your eyes slow your breathing down and, and the purpose is i'm going to invite you just to feel into to try and locate in your system this belief or this feeling that i'm not good enough you know, and I want you to do it gently and calmly in a relaxed fashion, ideally from a place of curiosity. And if you if you think to yourself, you know what, I don't want to do this bit, that's totally fine. There's just going to be a few minutes, but I invite you, if you if you can and you want to, just to take a moment, yes, to close your eyes, slow your breathing down. The best way to do that is to concentrate on breathing out for longer than you would usually. And just bring yourself into some form of mindful presence. And instead of kind of coming down from your head into your body, I invite you instead to just to widen your awareness to include your head and your body. And then as you breathe out, maybe relaxing your jaw, which lets your body know that you're safe. And then just before you breathe in, pausing. And then when you breathe in, breathe deeply and then pausing at the top of your in-breath before you breathe out. And then just trying as best as you can to come into stillness. If you have to scratch an itch or cough or rearrange your body, that's fine. But in the meantime, just enjoy being still. And then I want you just to, as best as you can, feel that kind of feeling that you're not good enough. The part that maybe pushes away compliments or doesn't feel comfortable when things are going well. or Doesn't allow you to put yourself forward or take full advantage of opportunities or that part that just holds you back, that we might locate or feel as, yeah, this feeling of, I'm just not good enough. And from a place of just objectivity, I want you just to notice that actually that feeling isn't really a belief, but rather more a desire. There's an energy in it where really it would say, I don't want you to feel good enough. Now, don't criticize that part or attack that part, even if that's surprising, whether you can locate that or if that feels true to you. I want you to feel it's not some passive, fixed belief. It's an energized, active part of you trying to continue this feeling that you're not good enough. It, it doesn't want you to feel amazing. And I don't want you to fight that part. We're going to come back and speak to that part later. So in the meantime, in as kind and as compassionate way as possible, say, I'm sorry we've been fighting. I'm sorry we haven't always seen eye to eye. I want to come back and speak to you a little bit later. And whether that connected for you or not, whether that was just, you didn't feel that or that didn't make any sense, don't worry. 
And if it did, we trust that we're here to talk to that part. And I invite that part to listen as we go into more detail now about why it does that. And so then you can just allow your eyes to open. And yeah, whether you connected to that or not, just for the purpose of this conversation, I'd like to explain why that, why there is a part inside most of us that doesn't want us to feel good. And essentially when we were younger and our needs were not being met, either in big ways by parents that were negligent or abusive or abandoning, or in lots of small ways, even in an environment where we had caring, loving parents, there are many, many moments and events where our needs are not being met. And we are being let down. In those moments, when we're two, four, five, seven, 12, all those different moments, particularly in the moments pre-seven though, when our needs aren't being met, we have one basic choice. It is either our parents are not okay and we're dependent upon them, or it is us. And as a child, it is preferable, preferable for us to rather think ourselves as failing, as inadequate, as deserving or undeserving, so deserving of the bad treatment. And the simplest, I saw a meme the other day well, that summed this up brilliantly. It said, don't shout at your kids. They won't hate you. They'll hate themselves. I just wanted to pause there and say how powerful that feels actually um i hadn't heard that quote before but i have heard one that says the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice and um i think what you've just shared is incredibly um yeah moving and powerful and deep and i'm seeing a lot of that in the chat as well um so let me just see if i've understood what you said so when we're young particularly we're in our formative time and our need is not met and we perhaps feel let, let down, There's, we can either think, well, that is genuinely my need not being met because someone has not been able to meet my need, like a primary caregiver or parent, or mm -hmm. it's something about me that's not worthy of love and needs being met. And it's, it's safer for us to assume the latter rather than to assume that our parents may not be perfect or are. Is that, is that kind of right? Mm -hmm. that exactly that. We cannot break the golden rule of the child psychology, which is my parents are, are good and safe and perfect. Mm. And it's not ability, it's survivalism. Our nervous system won't cope if the things we are dependent upon are not dependable. And they're not sometimes. And so what we do in those moments is we, we blame ourselves. And so we have inside us then a part of us that doesn't want us to feel good about ourselves. Because if we're okay, what the hell was that? What the hell was that? So the reason why someone will push away a compliment is what you're really saying if someone has dysfunctional sabotage levels which is more common than people realize is when i pay your compliment what i'm really saying is your parents let you down it's like no 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 i don't want to celebrate my birthday i won't send invoices even though people owe me money i won't receive your compliment and magically if i'm out at a bar there could be 25 men here that would adore me dote on me but no no i'm going to go for that one guy who will never text me back or see my value because actually that fits my narrative. So the two defensive beliefs that we build are, I'm not okay, and it's normal that people will let me know. Now, those beliefs are the formation of sabotage. And the sabotage is just a program designed by our protector. So it is our protector who is protecting us from the painful content for a child, which is my parents aren't as great as I need them to be. And it creates sabotage. No, no, it's you. And don't worry, people won't meet you. Needs. That's just normal. And so we normalize the way in which our parents are. So then we go and seek people to support that narrative. And we seek environments the way we can perpetuate our inadequacy. And when someone offers us a job interview or an opportunity, or we will, we will either throw a spanner in the works. Like I, I used to watch myself just saying something that I would never say. And just seeing it, just, just push someone away and marveling at calling myself an idiot, but I wasn't an idiot and it wasn't a lack of self-esteem. It was designed by a part of me. So I know um, people will be like, what, 
for some people this will be a bit of a surprise and and so so what's the answer and that's you know well just before we come to the answer because I'd, I'd love to hear what that is um it feels like you're saying this is very often something that gets sort of experientially wired in at an early age but it's not just that we kind of carry that forward into our adult life it's almost that we continue to recreate that dynamic in various sort of almost subconscious ways throughout our lives is that kind of what is that right 100 percent, yeah in psychology it's called projective identification identification we 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 attract people that will repeat the pattern and then we behave with people so that they will treat us that way they wouldn't even normally behave that way have you ever experienced that where you're kind of letting someone down in ways that you never let people down and, and that's something to do with their story, having a gravitational field pulling you into their expectations of being let down. And so, but this is not incidental, it's created by our psychology on purpose to help us. But of course it helped us when we were a child, but it, it doesn't serve us as an adult. Mm. Okay, but it gets in. I mean, I'm, I know you're gonna get into how we then address this sort of a uh, younger part of ourselves perhaps but I just feel like the kind of what's coming up for me is a sense of like it wasn't your fault <laughs> and it's you know and a lot of the the almost like inner blame you carry is doesn't need to be there because it's sort of it was a response to a situation that you brought forward into various aspects of your life or almost without it needing to be that way and that, as you said at the start that's rather liberating isn't it it's like wow okay what am I carrying that I don't need to carry it's hugely liberating but the challenge is uh, fixing this is it cannot be done at the adult level so Einstein famously said a problem cannot be solved at the level of consciousness it was created but in this in this with this psychology work it's the opposite it can only be fixed at the level of consciousness it was created which is why I believe and what I've experienced having gone on so many different courses and done so many different trainings and tried all of the different transformational tools I could get my hands on. Um, the process of meeting with the younger parts of ourselves frozen in time. It is not about as an adult, most of the people here will have accepted their parents' failings, have done all sorts of forgiveness techniques they've done buddhist meditation they've sent compassion they've had cleanup conversations they've done all this really cool stuff they know their parents did their best put a roof over their head it wasn't as bad as the starving kids in africa all the things we do to diminish how bad it was um, and deny how bad it was and to contextualize our parents upbringing and be forgiving of their own traumas all great and it doesn't touch the sides because we have to great space and people think inner child work is going in, meeting with your inner child and giving it a hug and saying that you love it. That's amazing and it's beautiful and that's part of it. But that's not what creates transformation. What creates transformation is sitting down with that kid, taking him by the hand or her and saying, I'm so sorry. It's now time to feel the truth. And the kid will shake its head. It's like, no, no, you're not ready. You can't know. This is too big. We'll be crushed. And it's like, no, you would have been crushed. This feels like the darkest, deepest, most horrible, most toxic thing you could ever go anywhere near. And the protector's like, police line, do not cross, do not enter. You'll be consumed into a pit of darkness if you enter into this place. But the truth is, you already know that you were let down. It's just the kid trapped in time, frozen with a whole sorts of limiting beliefs that it's, it's, it's fault and that it's normal that it will be let down. And so people say to me, you're just opening a can of worms. I'm like, no, we're rescuing kids. Mm. And it's immediately a relief. Is it emotional? Sometimes really profoundly emotional. Someone might cry for quite a long time. But those tears, if you access them, are just liberating because as soon as they start coming through your system, that younger part of you realizes I'm not five anymore and I'm not dependent on them. And I've, and I've actually done okay for myself. And so the solution is to feel the original heartbreak, but not at the adult level, as the child. So and if I, you I, can do that and then reparent them, hold them in that, then they integrate into your timeline with no longer needing your story to be different. And when you negate some aspect of your story, you are negating some aspect of you. And so as you bring them in, you integrate them, you find peace with your story, you then get to be amazing, not in spite of your past, 
you get to be extraordinary precisely because of it. And that's freedom. So although, Tom, I know you do this work often one-to-one -one with people, and this is obviously quite deep and rich stuff, I do think I would love you to help us learn a little bit about how you can have those conversations with the inner child, as you talked about. Before mm -hmm. we do that, I, 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 you said something to me when we spoke before that really stuck with me about how we can sort of orientate this more in our adult lives before we kind of look backwards as to the causes. And you said there's this quote about if it's hysterical, it's historical and like sometimes tuning into the things that make us really emotional now is a little mm -hmm. warning radar or not a kind of alerts us to some of the things that might have been un un unresolved. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Because I think that's a really helpful way of noticing this in a way. Yeah, well, I operate with the kind of beliefs that, you know, consciousness is, is trying to be free through us and as us, right? And, and so for me, our life is a constant reflection of how how, how, how free we are and what we're holding on to. So my clients might turn up angry because their boss has bullied them or, or because someone has left them. And I'm always, I, in 24 years, I've never found a present day frustration which doesn't have a foot in the past. So if you're having a disproportional response to your present day reality, what someone might call triggered or what I might call hysterical response, if you can just breathe into the experience of the energy of that emotion in your body and then literally ask it, how old are you? When has something like this happened before? What does this remind me of that is unresolved? And then it's incredible. If you can kind of show a deep willingness to go where, but these, these we start to see that the frustrations of our, our present day life are just signposts to things that are unresolved, that if we can access them, will liberate us. And when we get that, then every day is an incredible opportunity. You know, it's either a, it's either a day of ease or education, you know, it's, and it's all gold. It changes our relationship to reality because reality is actually trying to bring us home to peace. So well, I, I love this present day frustrations having a foot in the past. I wonder before we, Go then into the past i'd just love to hear from the community just to to give some examples and again this is entirely optional but if you've been touched by what tom has just shared there maybe you'd like to share something currently in your adult life that is a source of emotional drama or tension or his hysterical response from you i mean i i find that if i feel as though i've um let, if I if there's an implication that I've let someone down, it raises an unbelievable emotional response to me that I think, where on earth does that come from? And I'd love to hear some of your examples of what are situations in your adult life that bring up those kind of emotionally dramatized moments. So if you just want to type a few words in the chat and I'll just read out a few examples, because I think it'd be useful. So um, yeah, imposter syndrome, ho making holiday plans, feeling alone, feeling dismissed, my dreams being seen as a quiet one, um, uh, relationships, rejection, uh, not making it to an appointment, uh, not living up to expectations, um, feeling bullied, not being accepted, perfectionism, not being heard, health anxiety, feeling that something's unjust, not living an authentic life, feeling I'm not valued, being shot down and not having a voice, not being recognized, so I'm going to pause there. There's loads more coming, Tom, but um, I, I suspect you've seen quite a few of these before and quite a lot of similarities here. What is it bringing up for you? Yeah, I mean, I just, it, the, the, the most extraordinary thing about life and psychology is the fact that every single one of those things that the people are writing in the box, I have the most, the deepest compassion for mm -hmm. all those sensitivities. And they are the richest opportunities for you to go and find young versions of you who are all too ready, who are trapped in time, still experiencing things. So sometimes someone might say to me, oh, I'm afraid of public speaking, you know? And it's like, mm, no, your seven-year-old is, and you have an unresolved seven-year-old in your system and you're trying to make them speak in front of a room of adults. It's not, it's not age appropriate. Let's go find that part and find the part that's scared. And so you can start locating these parts. I mean, my, one of the most common things my partner and I say to each other is, how old are you right now? I mean, we can say it with compassion or if we're in not so generous ways, how old are you right now? But essentially that question is absolutely game-changing. If it's hysterical, it's historical. 
all of your present day frustrations will have a foot in the past. And if you don't think they do, you can still milk them for your liberation. You know, you can, you can get in there. And as part of this, we're offering in, in the resources that follow, we have some guided meditations that can help you track your triggerings and find these parts and reassure them and, and bring them home. Let them know it's over. Introduce them to your cat. Your inner children have got no idea where you live or what you've done. But don't also go, oh, it's okay, we can love ourselves, inner children, because, you know, look what we've achieved. Because that's conditional. So my mum says you love your kids, but you're in love with your grandchildren. And so I, instead of this being like a reparenting, think of this process as more of a re-grandparenting where you just bring this unbelievably sumptuous, like unconditional gorgeousness to all these parts with all these feelings. You sit them on your lap, you're like, tell me all about it. And you just affirm, not your fault, nothing to do with you, not normal, not okay. And just let them integrate into your calmed nervous system, help titrate their fear, their anger, and just breathe and expand them into you. And, and, over time, the more you do that, the more you will not just feel good enough, but you'll feel not just love for yourself, but an extraordinary amount of unconditional love for others. So if it feels appropriate, Tom, I'd, I'd love to, I feel like I've understood the idea that I could see a, a current trigger as a, as a window into what my inner child might, you know, be wrestling with I understand that there might be some kind of protector part of me that's trying to stop that conversation from happening but yeah. you know let's say I'm willing to try and reach out to my inner child that's feeling a bit like what have I been let down or whatever is going on mm -hmm. could, could, is there a way that you could sort of um do this in an interactive way or help us begin that conversation I know we're going to send around these fantastic video uh, sorry audio resources that you've got for people to do this in more detail and we'll send that out in the follow-up email tomorrow but I wondered yeah. if we can, you know, while we've got this precious time together, you could sort of begin that journey for us. And maybe is there a way you'd recommend we could start that now? Absolutely. So let's be clear. This is not about uh, inviting your inner child to come and visit you today. You can do that with the longer guided recordings. Uh, the purpose of what we could just do right now is just to meet with your protector and say, listen, I know you've been wanting me to feel bad about myself, pushing away opportunities. Um, making me feel not good enough in all sorts of ways and I realize now that's because you didn't want me to you didn't feel that I could meet with these other parts of me and real really feel the truth and so what we could do is a small process just to go in and instead of fighting your procrastinator or fighting the part that's avoiding love or addicted to things or just not in control or overeating or over drinking all these things you might beat yourself up about and see that most of them are driven by this part that wants you to be disappointed in yourself on purpose. And instead of fighting it saying, oh, oh, you're on my side and you always have been, but you don't need to protect me from the painful truth of my past anymore. I wanna go and find every single one of those kids and bring them home. And so I would like access. And so we can just, if you want to, and if you don't wanna do that right now, you don't have to, but the invitation is just to close your eyes. Just deepen your breathing. And just whether you connected with this part or whether you connect with that part completely, don't worry, you can, you can use these other resources. But if you can just imagine that there's this protector inside you, it could look like a, a, a ball of light, it could be uh, an old-fashioned kind of bouncer or security general. But a part of you who just doesn't think that you could have handled the truth of your innocence. And that what happened to you wasn't okay and it's not normal. And so you're able to imagine that protector, whether you visualize it or not, doesn't matter, but imagine it's listening. As I've negotiated with thousands of people's protectors with love and reverence and respect, I thank that part. And I reassure it that it is time and that it will be for your betterment and that you are ready. And that if over time you are 
prepared that you would like access to any younger versions of you still trapped in time, blaming themselves or thinking it's normal for them to be let down because you would like to bring them home. You, you would like to look after them. You would like to love them unconditionally beyond merit and achievement. So thanking your protector, understanding why it's been sabotaging, letting it know that it doesn't need to protect you in that way anymore and humbly, with great reverence, asking that it gives you access to any thoughts, feelings, or memories, or beliefs that you can now process in truth and bring all of you back to love. And so just allowing your eyes to open and you know, when I use the term inner child, it really, you can do inner child work on who you were yesterday. It's any part of you. Most of us have troubles from our very early years and through our teenage years and our early 20s and our early 30s. Our triggerings can come from anything that's happened before this very moment. But they usually ladder and stack. So we might go in and meet with our 16-year-old, but if you kind of say, okay, it was was there a younger version of this too? Then your 12 year old appears. And then, you know, so sometimes you, you're literally, you're having a conversation with four versions of you, all reflecting a similar flavor around a similar experience. Well, but just as a final yeah. contemplation before we go to a Q and A, I know you've got some questions, Mark. Mm. There's two questions that I like to ask everyone really. And I think they're, they're the most important questions that anyone can ask themselves. And the answer to the first one is really easy. So don't think it's some complicated answer, but we'll see if people get it in the chat box. Question number one, what is it that a newborn baby could do so that it would mean that it doesn't deserve love? People seem to be getting it. Nothing. Exactly. Perfect. Nothing. Question number two. Also, simple answer. Slightly harder than this one, but it should be just as quick and just as easy. When does that change? Perfect. Never. And when we get that, we can forgive every single thing that's ever happened to us and we can forgive every single thing that we've done. It's too hard being human. We're only alive for a fraction of time, nowhere near long enough to become wise or in control of anything. And so love, truth, forgiveness begins to move through us because it was blocked because a child didn't want to feel innocent because if they were innocent, then they were let down. But if we can feel the let down and not to rush to making to not rush to forgiveness for the parents. We have to feel the grief. We have to feel the anger. We have to go through the layers of the child's disappointment and their, res their, their responses. And then we have to look at the consequences. We have to feel the grief of what it's cost us. And then we have to also clean up conversations with people because we were being anti ourselves and pushing away love and sabotaging. We've probably done a whole bunch of hokey things that need to be cleaned up, that we have to take responsibility for. But we do all of that feeling good enough returns because it's our natural birthright. It's who we are, it's what we deserve. This makes me feel just an enormous sense of um, compassion for just human beings generally. I mean, everyone who's, who's ever felt not good enough and all those the children within each of us that have somehow experienced um, this kind of trauma, I guess. And um yeah i feel like for myself and also seeing what i'm seeing in the chat also i must say i know you said not to go there too quickly but as a parent myself and feeling about all my imperfections and all the things i screw up in terms of how i try to bring love uh, for my own children but yet get things wrong and 
bring all my own baggage to those relationships. I, I do also feel a real compassion for par every parent and primary caregiver of all time because uh, we're all just flawed human beings and um, none of us, I think, mean to leave that, um, you know, to create those problems for the inner children. But I think, so I just find myself generally filled with a sense of compassion for all beings really <laughs> yeah me too but I take some comfort I take some comfort because the more work I've done on myself the more I wouldn't change any of it and I am tr truly grateful and I play this game with my partner when maybe she's getting frustrated with her mother or father and I do it with myself I've played it on myself for years and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, looking at our kids and I say to her hey you know which hair would you change on her head? And she's like, what? I'm like, which hair would you change on her head, our daughter? And she's like, well, none. I wouldn't change a hair on her head. I'm like, well, then you can't wish to change one hair on your mother's head or your great grandfather's head or anyone's because it's all connected. And if your parents hadn't let you down as profoundly as they did at times, we wouldn't be together and these children wouldn't exist. And I track, I'm not good because I've, because I've, you know, got over my, in spite of my past, I am more beautiful because of what was difficult. Now that's not an open checkbook just to traumatize our children because they can use it for enlightening grist for their mill later. But I, you know, our job is to do a better job than we received, to pass on less. Really moving and profound stuff, um, Tom. Let's move to questions. So just a reminder, first of all, there's a Q&A function, folks. There's already some great questions, which I'm going to start going to, but you can vote on questions that you would like to have answered, and I'll try and pick out the ones that come to the, um, the top of the list. And Tara has started us off with something that links to what you've just been saying, really. I'm so worried about messing up my children, who are now young, in this case, two and three years old. Um, and there's some complexity there around it. I do think I lose my patience. Um, what can I do to ensure that they don't have this negative self-talk and feeling of inadequacy? I, I feel yeah. that very, very strongly too, Tara. Like, how do we avoid this? And <laughs> maybe we can't. Beautiful, beautiful question. I, that, the other day, it was a little while ago, um, it was when my, uh, my youngest daughter was about two and a half, three, and she was obsessed of like following me into the toilet. And I'd had a very stressed day you know, a very a stressful day. And on this particular moment, she, she decided she wanted to uh, help me with wiping, but I hadn't finished. So before I knew it, I had a young child's hands reaching between my legs. I hadn't finished. And I shouted, I really shouted. I'd had enough, just leave me alone. And, and um, my other elder daughter shouted, who's six, daddy don't shout at the baby. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm just frustrated. She's like, it's okay just take a breath and I was like and she and she and then I was like can you come and get her she's like no I'm writing out my angry words you know it's it, it you know and I was just like okay I've shouted at my kids that's not good but you know what it's what kids need what is actually way more powerful them is us messing up and then talking it through if we can do the cleanup well their emotional intelligence goes through the roof you know if kids had perfect parents how would they cope getting a job they would have no, they would not be used to working, operating with anyone normal. So it's actually okay to mess up if we can clean it up. And so what we do is if we have behaved inappropriately, we get them to say the words, daddy, that was not okay. That was your fault. I was innocent and that's not anything to do with me. So they don't need to say it in therapy later. That's what I get adults to say. So we just get them to say the words now and we apologize and we explain it. And we, we move on. And it avoids and that being carried forward for years and years. Yeah, and it's not repressed. Yeah, I, I, a personal it's story, I, you know, I grew up in what I had always seen and was a very loving home, but we didn't, as a family, do anger and conflict very well. It was kind of like, oh, no, we're a good Christian family, nothing here to see. And so I don't think I developed the ability to have disagreements and difficult conversations and painful reactions of anger and things. Like, they were kind of pushed down in me and... I have found that when I'm able to then, you know, for example, if my wife and I are having an argument and the kids see that, or I get cross with the kids, and then I can say, I'm really sorry, I lost my temper there, that was wrong. And you know, it's almost like having the drama and then addressing it in an emotionally wise way feels like a better grounding for life than a, nothing to see here. It really is. 
Yeah, it really is. I think it's actually, uh, honestly, I think it's better. Again, it's not an open checkbook just to shout at your kids. But I also do think, you know, anger is, 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 is a beautiful thing and when embodied and expressed. So we, you know, if we can feel everyone's just getting a bit tetchy, we play drum and bass music really loud and dance around and shout and howl at the moon, you know? And um, even when the moon's not out. And uh, for me, it's a thing of glory when I'm looking at my partner and our young kids like screaming and wailing and, you know, doing a very angry running man to banging drum and bass. I think that's healthy. And beautiful and I so we don't need a video of you all doing that would, would bring a lot of joy as well so <laughs> Kenzian has asked a really really kind of uh important question which i think com comes back to lots of what we talked about just how can we change the relentless pervasive negative thoughts of perceived inadequacy i mean i think you've hinted mm -hmm. at that throughout tonight but anything else you want to add on that you know these relentless thoughts yeah so first of all um when, when thoughts have um, have a kind of relentless nature, it's often because we're opposing them. Okay, we, if we're fighting and, it, and thoughts, our relationship to thoughts in that way are like the hydra. If you cut off one head, two rear. So you need to stop pushing those negative thoughts away and you need to, you know, essentially gently and in a controlled way, and you can use these recordings that we're going to gift you uh, to enter in to that voice that is anti you. And it begins with recognizing, oh, well, you want to be anti me because you want me to, you want me to think of myself as not okay. And sometimes it is violent and aggressive and vehement, and it can take some unpicking. But always underneath it, there is an upset and hurt child who is, has not been willing to admit the degree to which they were let down. Mm -hmm. Or we're fixated on hating ourselves because we've acted out. And when we act out, it's like a parent sitting down to play piano, playing badly and complaining about the music. So when we're teenagers, we may well have gone off the rails and done terrible things and not been proud of ourselves. So our saboteur can, has got lots of material with which to hate us. But actually, if we can track it back, we, we have to find our innocence and we have to feel all of the feelings beneath the words. And, 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 and then that part and you start to become friends. But here's the thing, when we're adopting our inner children, it's not like we're adopting some kids who've had a particularly difficult time of life. It's not going to be a matter of giving them one cuddle, one emotional release, and then suddenly you're going to be best mates with yourself. In some areas, it can take years mm. of dedicated, consistent self-care and self-love. And over time, you, you will become on your own side. So I'm, I'm not being flippant or just saying, oh, it's really easy. And this is really, really quick. I've been doing healing regressive work on myself for a long time and I still find errant parts with errant beliefs unnecessarily limiting beliefs that that can just begin to change and some things super quickly and other things take a lot longer on a sort of related point Joanna said does this, does this always go back to our parents which is an example you used a lot tonight or mm -hmm. or could it be other people like teachers at school for example Yes, so generally we have a whole bunch of experiences with other people that are unpleasant. But according to my beliefs, those things were probably happening because we, were, we have unresolved feelings regarding our parents. So, so most often if we're attracting people who are being mean to us or there's difficulties, it's because this methodology of this universe where it's trying to bring to our attention pain we're holding on to um, starts early. So yes, it's common that we'll go and work on that thing that a friend said or a parent said, but as we drop in, the parts, the nodal memories, the associated memories get younger and younger and younger, and I would lay most of it. But it's not blame at your parents, because what are we gonna do? Go and beat up your great, 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 great grandparents. It's, it's no one's fault, but you can't go to that cosmic spiritual forgiveness first. You have first to feel the unreasonable feelings of being heartbroken and let down and afraid and scared as the gold paint chips off your parents, you know, iconography in your heart. And you realize their fallibility and fragility and you mourn it because we may have got used to it as an adult, but when we first see through their perfection, it breaks our heart. This is a sort of heartbreaking process that leads to healing i guess is what you're saying yeah yeah um, you bring them home you bring them home mm. 
Abby, I love Abby's question here because it very much chimes with the ethos of this action of happiness community about not only how do we help ourselves, but how do we help each other? And so the question is, how do you support someone else who's experiencing or depression or anxiety and try to explore the good enough approach that we've been talking about here today, especially when their negative self-view is really entrenched? Can we do the sort of thing you've been doing for us today with people around us? Absolutely. I mean, one, I mean, talking to them about about this stuff and I have other resources that I'm happy to share as well. I have a video that explains all of this. So we can maybe add that to the resources, which then you can share with people or share this recording or however, so that people understand why they're doing what they're doing, because that can make a massive difference. But it can be incredibly powerful when someone is in the throes of the emotion to invite them to find the earlier counterparts within it. And so giving them a cuddle and saying, let me hold you as though you're four or how old are you? Let yourself go small. So my partner and I will take it in turns to go small in our arms. And it's okay, you know? And sometimes we both want to go small. Sometimes we both want to go big. And she needs me to be, you know, remember I'm the, the man in, the, in this, in our, and I think she wants me to hold her and, you know, and we, we, you know, which is how we roll. It's, it, it, it varies, but, but basically just inviting people to recognize that there is unresolved historical pain here that is pulling on your trouser leg. It is asking for your attention. All pain is as yet unlistened to freedom, but it can take courage to enter into these truths. Well, I think that's one of the, the only way, the I'm only sorry. way out is in, sorry. No, no, no. I love that. The only way out is in. I, I was going to say one of the key things I'm going to take away from this is this idea of um, if it's hysterical, it's historical. And use that sort of like when I feel a real rush of emotional, uh, I don't know, a sort of a, a signal to me that I'm really responding in a difficult way to something is like, well, let's just tune into what's behind that and where that, how, you know, your question of how old am I feeling right now? I think it's so powerful. But Laura's got a really interesting question, which is about how much of this is inner work as opposed to relational work. So she says, how, do, how might I approach this with parents? Like if they think I'm saying that they're not good enough, um, mm-hmm. you know, we, this could be well, it's a long question, but it's very difficult to have honest conversations without them feeling that I'm pointing the finger, which I don't yeah. want to because they're wonderful parents, but we live next door to each other. So our lives are intertwined. Is it helpful, Tom, for us to do this in relation or is it more of inner inner work i guess right a lovely question and uh so basically our relationships are always a reflection of this so our relationships are constantly healing on this we will we will interact with and attract people with um patternings that are designed it's not incidental hollywood tells us relationships about you know this joyful experience of loving cohabiting bliss no they're not Relationships here are as mirrors to the things you're holding on to. When it comes to speaking to your parents, as we begin to journey into our healing, it is really common that we want to talk openly and frankly with our parents about the terrible mistakes they made. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So that they can take some bloody ownership of what they've done to us and maybe apologize so that we can then move on. This will never work. And it is never useful or productive. When you have journeyed through all of these layers and you are ended up in a place where you recognize you are actually as hard as it was, this is about the evolution of your consciousness and evolution of shared consciousness. And it's actually as hard as it was an incredible opportunity for you to be even more incredible and amazing as a person. We are deeply grateful for everything that our parents did, profoundly so in a way where the only reason we would want to talk to them It's not so that they own up to the terrible things that they have done, because we wish for them the same freedom that we are now enjoying. And that is the difference between you are messed up and you messed me up and I'm angry with you and I can't function in life because if you failed me. No parent can ever hear that. But if instead it's like, well, it was hard, but I made it hard on myself because I made it mean that I wasn't okay. But now as I've transformed that, I'm more liberated and more amazing. And now I wouldn't change anything. And I feel so good. I love you. And I want you to know that whatever your parents did to you, it wasn't your fault. And you're loved. And I love you as you are. And thank you for everything you've done for me. In that vacuum, parents are like, no, I really let you down. And I'm so sorry. You actually get that purchase when you no longer require it. 
And that's an expression of love. And if you're listening to that and you're like, I am miles away from that and it makes you angry, honor that. It's because you've got more unreasonable healing to do. The first phase is absolutely vehement, unreasonable. You completely let me down and to feel the fury and grief and anger. So I do that with clients. And then after a certain point, I'm like, now you need to speak to your parents. They think they're finally going to get their pound of flesh. And I'm like, no, you have to apologize for the resentment that you've held on to, which is played out in the relationship. Because what happens is that all that, even if you go around and you're being civil, they feel that judgment, they feel that criticism. So they negate you. They won't like your life choices. They won't approve of your career. And it's a silent cold war. And they may well have started it, but you're perpetuating it. And the only way to shift that is with love and gratitude. But it can't be, gratitude can't be forced. It, it should arrive like happiness. You know, it, you can't chase it. it. It arrives, lands on your shoulder like a random beautiful butterfly because of all the other things you're doing to make that more likely. Wow, Tom, I'm, I'm, I don't know about anyone else here, but I'm getting kind of shivers down the spine hearing and thinking about some of this. And um, it, this links to Abby's question, which we, I mean, we're not going to have time for anything more now, unfortunately. But Abby said, how do we move forward with the relationships that we have with the people who let us down? And you've just explained that beautifully. But what it's brought up for me, Tom, is this sense of recognising that, you know, yes, we have the inner child within us that's still, you know, dealing with past traumas. But actually, when you look at our parents, you remember that they are bringing their inner children as well from what relationship they have with their own parents and back and back and how, how it's continued. And that again, brings up a sense of, wow, we're all just like in need of a bit of self-love and a bit of love for each other. Totally. I mean, it's just, like I say, what we're going to do, just go and beat up our great, 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 great grandparents. We can, <laughs> can get to all the forgiveness stuff later, but I will say this one thing though, it is all about unconditional love, but that doesn't mean unconditional proximity. So there are some people because of how they're turning up in the world. I love them unconditionally from some distance. That's very wise. And I just want to echo what something that my colleague Sarah just put in the chat, which is to thank all of you for sort of taking care of yourselves in this event and the things that it's brought up and the, the compassion and the wisdom that I've seen in the chat in response to what you shared. Tom, we're, we're out of time, but just to recap on uh, what tomorrow we sent out, you have very generously gifted three free audio recordings which go deeper on on some of these topics and I believe you're also going to set up a special sort of a more uh, detailed deeper dive if you like a sort of four-hour workshop where people a smaller group can kind of work with you on this and yeah. we'll send a link to where people can find out more about that and if you'd like to sign up and I think you were offering to give um, some proportion of any profits to support the charity as well if people want to mm -hmm. take up that offer so um, thank you for your generosity in that, but also particularly for giving your time and your wisdom to us today. It's felt really special and very, um, very rich and deep. And I can see a lot of gratitude for you in the chat. Um, Tom, final word to you. Is there any, any last thought you'd like to leave us with as we sort of part today? Um, I guess for me, unconditional love is not about loving people because of who they are. It's about loving people because of who you are. Yeah, well said. Um, I'm still processing that one myself, but um, thank you <laughs> so much for everything you've shared. Thank you to everyone who's been part of this. Uh, do join us again for another live event soon. And Tom, keep up this life-changing work. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity. And thank you everyone for participating so beautifully. Mm -hmm.